Hi, I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and today I'm sharing with you some thoughts. Okay, so this is these are some thoughts. This is something that is bugging me. I'm feeling quite agitated in myself because I am worried. I'm worried about where the pandemic or the epidemic, uh, you could call it, is going, and I'm concerned that there is too little focus on trying to understand what is going on and just trying to treat or intervene on what could be a very complicated situation. So you have to bear with me. I'll be trying to look at some of the wastewater and infection levels. So this is from the CDC. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll be looking at a couple of papers with regards to the class switch about IgG4. And I'll be looking as well at a paper with regards to kinds of diseases that can come occur because of this kind of class switching. And that's really where I'm coming from. So before I start going to this in a little bit more detail, I'd just like to encourage anyone who is interested. This is a full course special. Uh, looking at a number of different topics, significantly discounted. If you want to support the research, there is a link there as well. So for those who are interested, please, there is a lot of work to be done and we need all the help that we can get. So let's just reflect on where I'm coming from. Essentially, I am concerned that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, whichever variant, is continuing to circulate primarily in highly vaccinated regions. And it doesn't seem as though there is a clear explanation as to why that is occurring. I'm going to be sharing with you now why I think it's occurring. And then I'll be trying to expand on why it is that I am feeling agitated. I'm actually feeling more concerned now than I did in March 2020. And I was concerned then as well. So let's start with some basic things. As, as usual, I always start with the structure of the virus. And you have here a picture of the virus. Uh, this, is, um, this is it in gray here, a nice circular globule. And on the surface in blue, you have the spike proteins. And these red dots are the membrane proteins. And the orange dots are the envelope proteins. The body, in terms of natural immunity, usually makes antibodies across multiple uh, different epitopes, including the nucleocapsid protein here. And this is why, in a sense, natural immunity tends to be very broad, especially at the mucosal level. And part of the challenge we're having now is that by vaccinating against the spike protein, it could imply that the immune system is specifically just targeting this area. The problem is, is that as we have variations in the spike protein, if the immune system is only targeting this or primarily targeting this, it will be harder for the immune system to control the variants as they continue to evolve. Um, I've been trying to find a, a sensible explanation to demonstrate what it's like with the immune system, but the immune system, when it's looking at the mucosal level, is looking for any coronavirus. So it's not just SARS-CoV-2 or any specific variant. It's any coronavirus. And sometimes a rhinovirus as well is unable to get through because it just recognizes the viral response. It can produce interferon. When it becomes too focused on the spike protein, you can then have an issue with regards to the immune system recognizing the virus initially and therefore dealing with it. That's my concern as to why we may be seeing what is a growing trend across the, um, the world. And certainly the images here from the CDC seem to highlight that uh, this is looking at um, wastewater collection. So they're looking at stool samples, looking at viral levels. And you can see here large increases in red, um, increases of 10 to 99% in orange, stable um, here is 9 to 9%. And the biggest area is the large increase. And this is across multiple sites in the United States. And I suspect that this is occurring 
and not just in the USA, but across the first world. It means that we're moving into another wave of the pandemic. And the question that I am concerned about is if we're not thinking carefully, we won't be able to clearly mitigate what, what's going on. So I'm taking here a quotation from risk mitigation hierarchy. You have to understand is, as I said, I, I am agitated. And so I am looking for answers. I'm preparing for the worst, hoping for the best. That's how I look at it. And so part of that risk mitigation um, hierarchy is you're aiming to avoid negative impacts. Or else, if you can't avoid the negative impact, you try and reduce the negative impact. Or else, if you can't reduce the negative impact, you try and remedy the negative impact. And if you can't do that, you try and then compensate for it. And this is a risk mitigation hierarchy that's used in the corporate world when they're looking at trying to identify threats that could occur across the um, population or whatever industry it is. So I'm applying that thinking, preparing for the worst with regards to COVID-19. And in my view, this is relevant when I look at the CDC data here. And this is the up-to-date data from the CDC. So they are looking at COVID-19 new hospital admissions by week. And you can see here in September, you're seeing this gradual uptick in cases. So it is still lower than it was. But as we go into winter, I would expect that this is going to rise significantly over the next six months. And so the question is, what is causing this? What is the mechanism that is leading to increased COVID circulation, increased hospitalization, increased wastewater levels? And so that brings me back to the basis of research. So there's an unusual thing that has been happening, and this is a publication from um, August, and they were looking here at the class switch towards a spike protein-specific IgG4 antibodies after mRNA vaccination and how it depends on prior infection history. So that's what the paper was about. It was published in August 2023, very, very important paper. And essentially what they're talking about is that the immune system produces a number of antibodies. The long-term antibodies tend to be IgG. And it has four different classes within it, IgG1, IgG2, IgG3, IgG4. IgG1 is the main one that triggers the immune system and causes the immune cells to respond in an inflammatory way. IgG4 tends not to occur as commonly, and it is more the tolerant, a better way of, I'm using tolerant to, so that you can understand what it means. It's not as simple as that. But what that antibody is doing is trying to almost dampen down the immune system because it's suggesting that there is a protein or a pathogen that it doesn't want the immune system to overreact to. And so this is what happens, say, with beekeepers. They get stung all the time, and so they have a high IgG4 um, level towards the bee venom so that their immune system doesn't overreact to it. What we seem to be having here now is that in the context of the highly vaccinated regions is we seem to be having high levels of IgG4. And this is taken from the same paper here. And so this is it looking at this is figure five, looking at that specific um, uh, class switch to IgG4. Important to look down here, and you have to see here the, the colors. Let me make it a bit clearer with this pointer. So in blue is spike specific IgG1 by percentage, orange is IgG2, gray is IgG3, and yellow is IgG4. And when you look here, this is a convalescent patient, so a patient who has been infected and has recovered. And you can see that the blue here, 90% of it, is IgG1. Only 1% is IgG4. 6.9% is IgG3. And only 1.4% is IgG2. So the primary immune response is IgG1. That's normal. In patients who have been hospitalized, IgG4 is still, IgG1 is still dominant, 
but you have a higher level of IgG3 as well, which is also triggering the immune system to be more inflammatory and I guess target the virus. So this is an important baseline for what would happen normally. Then what they looked at is what happens in patients who have been infected first and then had the mRNA vaccination. And what they found is that after vaccination, they found that it decreased IgG1, um, decreased to about 88%, but you had a much higher level of IgG4. When you had mRNA vaccination first and then infection, you only had here about 52% IgG1 and here 41% IgG4. And in the context of no infection, so if somebody just had mRNA with no infection, it's only 50% that's IgG1 and almost 46% that's IgG4. And so this is a pattern. This is an example of the vector-based they tend not to have so much of an IgG4 response. Part of the question that the scientific community should have answered is why does this occur with mRNA and not really with natural immunity and not so much with the vector-based back vaccines? I've had some thoughts which I've shared in some of the courses. So if you're interested in hearing my thoughts on it, you can take a look at that. So that's the bit that worries me because if you're having the IgG4 as the predominant response, it's almost telling the immune system to tolerate the virus. And the question I have clinically is, what does that mean in the context of infection? Because does it mean, therefore, that the person has either mild or no symptoms? Because the immune system is no longer responding to the spike on the virus. And so therefore, we can be lulled into a false sense of security in thinking that because the symptoms are mild, it's good. Now, it's good that it's not severe disease, but if we're having recurrent infection, and that's what the wastewater samples are showing, the COVID infection levels are rising, there is a disconnect here that needs to be clarified. And that's the bit that I'm saying from a scientific point of view is really concerning me because I don't think it's necessarily a good thing. IgG4 has its benefits, but it's not always associated with the situation for a beekeeper. This is completely different because you don't actually want the virus to circulate in the organs, which is what we saw in the pathological samples of uh, patients who were vaccinated, they had much higher viral dissemination into organs. And so I can't imagine that's a good thing. But the problem is, is that it doesn't present initially with symptoms and therefore can be underestimated. An example, I've been trying to find a good example to explain what I'm talking about. The closest I have is what happens with HIV. And just be clear, I'm not talking about there's a clear association with HIV and COVID. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just explaining to you the importance of understanding disease to see whether or not the infection is relevant. So in the context of HIV, there are no symptoms initially. It's not until the CD4 levels have gone down, that's the lymphocyte levels have gone down very low, and then you start having recurrent infections, that you realize that the person has shifted from being HIV positive to having AIDS. The point is, is that just because they had no symptoms when they were originally infected, because you will only know that they're positive if you do a blood test, they won't necessarily have many symptoms. That lack of symptoms doesn't mean that you ignore it. And that's what I'm saying here in the converse situation, just because the symptoms are mild or very slight in the context of IgG4, I don't necessarily think that should be ignored. I'm now going to finally show you a, a link to another paper because I've been thinking about it and trying to find an analogy. So this is a paper from 2018. And in this case, they were looking at Epstein-Barr virus 
lytic reactivation, that's infectious mononucleosis, um, induces IgG4 production by B host lymphocytes in Graves' diseases patients and controls. Now, they were looking at Graves' disease among a specific cohort of patients who had Epstein-Barr disease. So it's, it's not necessarily that IgG4 causes uh, Graves' disease. I'm just using this as an example. And in this paper, what they were finding was that they were noticing that there were specific characteristic histological findings and high serum IgG4 levels in these patients who were having a reactivation of uh, Epstein-Barr virus. And the reactivation with IgG4 production was then, in this case, in Epstein-Barr, Epstein B uh, EBV positive cells or IgG4 positive plasma cells were then present in the thyroid tissue of Graves' disease patients with lymphoplasmacytic infiltration. So this is what was happening in the case of Epstein-Barr reactivation triggering IgG4 specific to Epstein-Barr. And so again, let's be clear, this is not talking about Graves' disease in the context of COVID, but I'm highlighting here that we have evidence that IgG4 can cause problems in the context of reactivation or recurrent infection with other diseases. The problem is these things don't present initially. And if you're not looking for it, you're not going to see it. And that's where I say that we have to be far more savvy from a scientific point of view. It's not about just what you're seeing. It's anticipating what else could happen. Risk mitigation. Again, I say, Avoid the negative impact. But in order to do that, you have to know what the negative impact is and look for it. Then if you see it, try and reduce it. If you can't reduce it, you remedy it. If you can't remedy it, you compensate for it. The risk mitigation hierarchy is highlighting that from a scientific point of view, we should be risk mitigating, anticipating the worst and hoping for the best. So therefore, when scientists say there are no problems without looking for it, that is not actually scientific and that is not actually in the benefit of patients or the population. You're far better off being very concerned, like I feel, being very suspicious, looking for problems, and then if they don't appear, wonderful. But not to look and to hope that everything is okay in my view, does not represent a clear and coherent scientific approach. I hope that that makes sense to you. This is a complex topic and one that I have been thinking about and trying to process carefully because I think it is extremely important as we move into the winter because the disease has changed. We're not going to see severe COVID-19 as we had in the early part of the pandemic, but it doesn't mean that we won't necessarily see high morbidity, that's illness, or mortality, which is death. Let me hope that I am wrong. But my responsibility is to make sure that we have reflected on all of the outcomes and as best as possible to try and mis risk mitigate against it. Have a good evening. Look forward to sharing more information with you soon.